the fat, if you put it between your fingers, it takes less than three seconds to start melting that fat down. The Akaushi breeding puts a buttery flavor into the meat and it makes it extremely more tender. We believe in dry aging, but the hanging process does have a direct benefit to the texture and the taste of that meat. So if I'm going to have a steak, I want it to be dry aged, not wet aged. Once you eat Akaushi burger, you won't want anything else. It is, it is a great tasting beef. My wife had some fatty tumors around her elbow. Within two weeks, they're gone. They know that we raise our cattle correctly, very humane. So that's where the market's going to be, knowing where you're getting your animal from. Welcome every day. Today we have uh, Mr. Pete Ballou with us. Pete, thank you for being here. Where are you located just out of curiosity? Thanks. Thanks for having me on the show. We're in Andrews, Texas, far west Texas, next to the New Mexico border. So it's okay. So Andrews, Texas, that's not too far from, is it far from Clovis, New Mexico? About a hundred miles away. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I used to live in New Mexico. I guess just for the sake of introductions, could you just share a little bit about yourself and what you do and things like that? <clears throat> yes, we farm and ranch here in West Texas. We raise Akaushi cattle or Akaushi bulls on Angus cattle. So we have a 50-50 cross. We have been doing that for the last five years. We, in the most recent two years, have opened up a beef processing plant and a full-scale meat market. We also have online beef sales through a company called HLC Meats, which stands for Heartland and Cattle. That's the name of our ranch. And that's what we do. And uh, we're here. We raise great quality cattle. And I think that's what the community is looking for, is the type of cattle that they can verify, that they can know what they're eating, they know is healthy, and that's what we're here for. So you said you've been doing that for five years. Prior to that, were you also in the cattle business or you were you? Yes, just, yes. Okay. We just raised Angus cattle at that time. Okay. And so what was, so you said, forgive me if I pronounce Akaushi cattle. I'm not familiar with that breed. What, what was it? Akaushi is a Wagyu. Okay. But when I say that, all Wagyu are not Akaushi. Akaushi yeah. is a Japanese breed of its own. And... It's different than what you term as a Wagyu because Wagyu stands for black Japanese cow. And Akaushi is actually the herd name. So we've got this Wagyu means black Japanese cow. What are the, what I understand with one of the reasons people often select a Wagyu type of breed of cattle is it's known for its propensity to marble out really nicely. That's some of the genetics. Obviously, out there in West Texas, you've got a particular environment, hot, not a lot of water, not a lot of rainfall, I assume. Right. Um, how, are the, how are the cattle adapted to where, where you live? Was there a re what was the reason to select that breed of cattle, just out of curiosity? The reason we selected Akaushi was we were looking for a healthier breed of cattle, which Angus are very healthy. They do well out here. They're, they marble well, but we were looking for something more. When we found the Akaushi, we found their marbling to be extremely good. We found that their oil in the marbling is a very high quality oil that's also heart healthy for you. So it made it a perfect choice for our operation. When you say they're oil, I don't usually associate cows with oil. Typically, I know some of the Wagyu tends to be very high in monounsaturated fat, particularly in, in marbling in general, tends to be high preference mono yes. over saturated fat. But is that what you mean by the oil? Are you talking about, what yes, do you mean by oil? Oleic, and I'm not pronouncing that correctly, I know. Okay, the oleic, oleic acid? Yes, thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay. And, and you said you have your own processing facility, which is nice because I know that's one of the struggles with a lot of meat you know, producers is or beef producers getting those animals processed because there's waiting lists and it's backed up. And if you miss your opportunity, you're, you're screwed or something like that. But how did you come to the decision to buy your own processing facility? We were selling our meat online originally. We were having to find a USDA processing plant that had the ability to cut our meat. We found these, but they were three to four hours away from us. So it was very hard to take cattle there and pick cattle up. 
get your meat back. And our cuts were not always the same. When I sell a tri-tip online or in my store, it needs to be the same each and every time. And so we determined this is what we need to do. Went to our local bank, showed it to them. They got excited. A year later, here we are. We are yeah, I mean, USDA. You are. You said you are, you are USDA. So you can. So that the implication of that means you can ship out of state, right? Basically, with that's correct. Anywhere in the United, United yeah. States. And do you guys ship all fifty, or where do you guys ship? Continental U.S. Where do you guys ship to? Yeah, all fifty. Okay. And we do. Nice. <clears throat> excuse me. We do ship out of the country, but that's private. That's just someone wanting our beef in Bogota, Colombia. So How is that? Ship. Is that legal? I'm just, I don't know. I'm assuming. Yes. Yes. As long as you have the the correct paperwork. I got it. Okay. Because I hadn't heard a lot of overseas. I know there was a guy that shipped me some beef from Canada one time. And he said he literally had to drive to the border and walk it across and then ship it. It was weird sort sort of deal. But what has been, obviously Angus has been very popular. They've done a tremendous, Black Angus branding has been tremendous in this U.S. country. People associate that with high quality beef. Correct. And what, in your opinion, is different, better taste, flavor, nutrition-wise about the Akiyushi Angus Cross compared to just Angus okay. itself? The Akiyushi breeding puts a buttery flavor into the meat, and it makes it extremely more tender. The more marbling you have, the less connective tissue you have in that piece of meat, making it a tenderer, easier to chew meat. So, that was our reason for Akaushi. Taste and tenderness. Taste and tenderness. Okay. And I can appreciate that. When you, want, when you get a steak, you want it to be nice and flavorful and tender and, and all that stuff. And That's right. It's, got, it's funny. I got a couple from France staying with me right now. And I'm cooking them up some nice steaks here. And they're amazed at how tender and, because they're used to the meat in France, which is a little, probably a little tougher and, and not as flavorful. But I think we do a pretty good job here in the U.S., quite honestly. Have you... Has, are you guys intergenerational as far as ranching? Has it been in your family for a while, or did you guys start on your own time? Yes, we are a fourth-generation rancher. Okay. My father, grandfather, and great-grandfather were in ranching, and my wife's father, grandfather, and great-grandfather were in ranching. Good for you guys. And you got, is there, is, are you going to pass it down to another generation? Yes, we have family that, that's taking the ranch over at some point in time. Good, good to hear. That's awesome. What, as far as, because West Texas may not, I don't know, maybe it's, it seems like there are easier places to ranch. You go see Virginia or I was out in Oregon where it's raining, there's plenty of grass. How tough is it to ranch in basically the desert, basically? How hard is that? It's extremely difficult. We have been in a drought for the last couple of years. Uh, Our grass is short. We do not have the type of pasture you want grass-fed beef from. This is far west Texas, desert country. We have scrub brush. We have other things they eat, which does disort this. It does make the meat taste different. So that's one of the issues. We cannot run as many cattle per acre as they do in other parts of the country. But this is the ranch we're on. It's deeded. It's ours. So this is where we're at. Yeah, I just wonder about it because, like I said, it's e- some places yeah. easier than others. And so what is the stocking rate for per acre out there? Then what do you guys do? You one know, head one, for every 78 acres. One head for 78 acres? Wow. Yes. Okay. That takes a lot of acreage to run a few cows. It does take a lot of- How many acres are you on? We're about 16,000 acres right now. 16,000 acres. Okay. That's pretty, pretty good size. I know there's some ranches somewhere in Texas. I can't remember some of the names. There are like millions of acres somewhere. Right. I can't remember. Down in South Texas, I think, if I'm not, not mistaken. Was it hard to transition to that new breed? Was there any challenges? <clears throat> it took us about three years to get all the cattle bred to Akaushi and getting where we had the markability of the cattle where they were ready to market. Yeah, it took about three years. We also do DNA testing on all of our calves, so we know exactly the pedigree, exactly the dad, and the percent of Akaushi in that calf. Okay. 
And is it a 50-50 blend typically or what's, yes. uh, what's uh, 50, 50. okay, 50-50. And Angus are traditionally pretty big, big animals. They, they put on weight. That's one of the reasons they're, they're surprised as, as they put on a lot of meat. And I think they finish out, what, 1,000, 50, 12. I, I know you use a limit. You don't want to get too big a cow because then they won't process them for you. But what, is there a size difference between the cross and the standard black Angus that you guys have? No. The Akushi breed actually look like an Angus. They're just red. They are about the same size. They have the same body contour. So, no, we have good cattle. We like to finish them out thirteen to 1,500 pounds before they go to, to the processing plant. And when, what, are they red or are they black? Most of them are red. Okay, interesting. I guess it doesn't uh, – my understanding is red is better for heat tolerance anyway. When it's hot out, they yes, tend to it be is. better than a black animal does. Yeah, It is. And so 13, 1,500 – pounds is a big animal i thought some of the processing facilities got mad if you got too big and they wouldn't hang it or something like that <clears throat> some do we we have a limit here that you have to be over 900 pounds and under about 1700 okay That's we do have a, <clears throat> we have them coming in from the feedlot from our customers not from us but from our customers they come in 15 1600 pounds big beef and how long does it take you to finish an animal Wagyu, I'll just clarify this a little bit. A Wagyu takes about a year to finish after it's been weaned and put in a feedlot. Akushi are very similar to Angus. We can have them ready in about five to seven months. After weaning. weaning. So yes. they wean it about, what, six months or something like that? Is that right? Six months, seven months. We do it on size and weight. Yeah, they're like, and, what, 600 pounds when they're weaned? Yeah, five, 600 six to pounds seven hundred pounds. pounds. Yeah. I know a little bit about cows. Yeah. <laughs> More than the average doctor anyway. That's but, right. Because I, I like eating them and I had to learn a lot about it. So why, so you got your own processing facility. Do you process other people's animals too? Sounds like you do or yeah. Yes. We're open to the public also. I see. And we can hold, we can probably process about 35 animals a week. Okay. And that's right. really working hard. Yeah. That's great. You know, obviously there's facilities that are putting through thousands of animals a day, yes. some of these gig gigantic ones. So it's, uh, so it's obviously, and to your mind, was that a difficult thing to get the investment? Is it hard to get a, a processing facility built? How much capital does it, it take? I mean, obviously we did it, it during COVID. Yes. Iron prices, supply prices went up extremely high. It, it was a challenge, but we did it in nine and a half months. And we did most of it by ourselves doing all the internal work. So it was a chore, but very interesting and knowledging, giving us knowledge on how to take care of this thing. And is it on your ranch, the processing facility, or is it off the ranch? It, it was going to be originally, but we have an economic development board here in town. And West Texas is known for oil. Matter of fact, Andrews is really and truly the oil capital of Texas. So we have a Economic Development Corporation that mainly strives to work with the oil field companies out here, and they have developmental areas around the town. They heard about us and came to us and offered us two acres in the area of the foundation, and we took them up on that. They turned around and gave us tax abatement and 100000 over five-year period. Uh, 20,000 a year. So yes, we took them up on it. It is not on the ranch, but it's five miles from my headquarters. Okay. So an easy trip back and forth. Yes. And you, you said you have what stocking over 16,000 acres, 78 acres per annum. How many animals do you guys run? We have about 150 mother cows right now. Okay. And, and, and do you got, so do you guys preference the heifers and the cows as opposed to steers and things like that? We do not. We, we are not keeping any of our heifers because there will be 50% Akaushi. So we're keeping our mother herd all Angus. Okay. And then what are we eating? What are you guys, what are you guys selling to eat? I know, I know some people preference to eat steer. They think the meat's different. There's differences between the sexes. Are you, any thoughts on that? There, there is not to us. Okay. They are, they are identical. So we do not differentiate. Okay. And... So you said you sell, what was, remind me of the name again of the, of the company. 
It is Broken Heart Butchery is the name of the butcher shop. And the website is hlcmeats.com. Okay. HLC Meats. And so you said you guys ship out of state throughout the U.S. Are your biggest customers still local or where do you get most of your, where do you, where do you get most of your business from? Yeah, our, our biggest customers are local. We can, at the butcher shop, we can cut a Akaushi calf up on a Thursday and be pretty well sold out of it by Monday. Doing that on the website's not quite that easy. Yeah, sure, sure. It takes a little while to ship. And two-day shipping, typically, is that perfectly yes. what you guys shoot for? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Any Because I know some of the problem is, I know I've talked to other ranchers that are direct to consume, and I say sometimes the the carrier loses the stuff or they delay it and it's a nightmare because you got to eat the, you, some, you end up eating that and it's a difficulty with the shipping you guys got that was, was there troubles getting that squared away initially or did you guys get that pretty well figured out yeah we've got it figured out now when we first started it was extremely hard to <clears throat> offer guaranteed two day shipping if it says perishable on the box with most shippers that guarantee's not there. So it would be delayed at an airport and not be delivered for three days. And to try to get your shipping and insurance back on that was extremely hard. But we did figure it out. We've got it going now. And we're getting deliveries in two days, very typically. Yeah. Do you guys do like FedEx, UPS, or who's the, yes. who's the main character that, that does that? Yes, oh, those, those are the those two. Guys. Yeah. Okay. And the... As far as what percentage of your, your sales are direct consumer online versus the local stuff? About 30% is online. <clears throat> we don't sell as much during the summer as we do during the winter. And it's because of the heat issue that we prefer not to ship a bunch out in the summer. Winter doesn't bother us at all. So as we get in the cooler times, our shipping gets a lot stronger is that just because cattle have a hard time putting on weight in the heat or what's what's yeah okay yeah makes sense and then i don't know if you you're probably aware of this obviously you guys the u.s cattle industry is at a 50 year low or 60 year low we're down to 1960 levels so there's been i know i saw something about prices going up or something i know i i don't understand all the math you probably know better than me but are are you much into the commodity market is that part of your deal or are you completely independent of that we sell a few of our calves to to other processors that can't get as much beef as they need also. The market is extremely good right now. We are the trembling you feel that seems like an earthquake. That's ranchers spinning in their grave because prices are so high. But it, it's a good market. Yeah, yeah. And I just... Uh, I don't know if you on the global stage. The UN is meeting right now at COP twenty eight, and they're about to recommend that all that that Americans and other Western countries dramatically reduce their consumption of ruminant animals, which obviously include cows, sheep, and things like that. Are, are do you as a, a rancher? Are you is there a community of ranchers, cattle ranchers in the U.S.? Are they do they have any thoughts on this or, or plans to? prevent that i'm trying to do my best to help <laughs> and i've been right. talking with folks from the ncba and, and saying hey look you got to do a better job of promoting beat and fighting this nonsense right. but what are your thoughts on that you're out in west texas where obviously oil is being attacked beef is being attacked what are your thoughts global warming i, I do believe is an issue and but i do not feel that cattle ranching and the breeding and raising beef is the biggest issue that we have to deal with right now. Yes, there is a consortium of, of ranchers that are concerned with this. There, there are quite a few that don't worry about it. So it's a mixed bag. Yeah, like I said, I'm worried about it because <laughs> I just, I, I, um, maybe this is controversial. Do you feel that the checkoff has done a, an adequate job of representing your interests and getting my understanding is their job is to promote beef and i don't know i don't know i remember beef is what's for dinner when it came out in 1992 with robert mitchum and they revised it with sam Elliott in 2000 but since that time i don't see it i don't see it as a consumer and i told that to the ncba folks i said look i don't your advertising to me has been ineffective what are your thoughts on that is, I, are you I, okay with I, that i agree or? with you i, I the the beef checkoff does other things besides advertising 
But yes, I agree with you. The advertising needs to be stepped up for the beef industry. People need to know where their beef comes from, how it's grown. And the only way to get that out is through advertising. Yes, I agree. This is a little this is a little off tangent stuff, but I know there's people concerned about what when they talk about how their beef or some people are concerned about are they going to get mRNA, mRNA vaccines and things like that. Do you have an opinion on that? Most cattle are vaccinated standardly. That's been practiced for many I'm sure you can tell it ever since you've probably been ranching. Yeah. But thoughts on that? People are freaking out about that and I hear about that and I'm like, I don't think that's a, the issue in the United States, at least at this point. It, it is not it is not legal to give that right at this point in time. When, if it does become open to the market, most rangers will not use that product. We vaccinate for our known illnesses, and that's it. If we have anything get sick that we have to give an antibiotic to, it comes out of the program and is sold to the public. Yeah, we don't believe in that. Yeah, yeah, there's, I've, I've seen a lot of ranchers that, that, that do that. And I, I think, I, and I don't know, and you may not know, because I, I thought I heard something about Perhaps in the hog market, they may be using that to some degree. Maybe, maybe not. I'm not sure. Where do you think, obviously, there's, obviously, you're seeing this push for reducing beef herds, maybe adding feed additives to re- reduce the methane output from enteric fermentation. Perhaps, maybe, there's a lot of talk about so-called regenerative agriculture where you multi, multi-species and multi, you move them all frequently. How does, is that something that you consider, is that something that you could do in West Texas, or what are your thoughts on that? Not really. Our country is cattle country. Sheep do not do well. Other animals, other species do do not do well here. So for West Texas, no, we are a cattle industry, and that's it. There, <clears throat> there are feed that you can feed to your cattle to reduce the emissions. Is it worth what they actually put out compared to what they're considered to put out? I don't think it's there. I think it's very light. Yeah, it's controversial. I know there's a fellow named Frank Mittlauner, as UC Davis. He's doing a lot of work on feed additives, and he's shown some progress and some promise, particularly in the dairy industry, I think, is where. Right. Because dairy is done very differently than beef cattle, as you, as I'm sure you're aware. But it could be that it's mandated. I don't know. Do you, I, you know, it could be something like that. So you said it takes you guys five to seven months to finish your animals out. They tend to lay down pretty nicely. What is the weight gain per day when they're finishing? Is it like? four four pounds we, a day or something like that we shoot for five pounds a day during the summer it goes down to two and a half three pounds during the fall and and spring you'll get five to six pounds cold of winter probably four pounds yeah it's interesting because i remember back maybe a year or two maybe two years ago they had a huge problem with a bunch of black cattle dying i think up in kansas it was like it was just a horrible video of like thousands of dead dead cattle and it was this sort of heat thing and people were thinking it was like some government conspiracy or something like that but how do you deal with the heat in te- west texas it's got to be pretty hot out there at time and how do you and, and this year particularly i know this year you guys are up above 100 for at least a month straight how do you deal with that with those animals and keep them comfortable and and protected <clears throat> we we have multiple waterings per pasture so they <clears throat> have to travel less than a half a mile anywhere in that pasture to find water we do not have trees out here unless you plant it. We have mesquite bushes. We do quite a bit of grubbing of our mesquite to improve our land, but we do leave a lot of the bigger mesquite to provide shade. Heat and, and a death toll has not been an issue out here in the past, and we we're in the 110s at times. Not really an issue. Here's another question. I've heard often that obviously it's important, the breed of the animal, how you raise them, how you finish them, but equally as important when it comes to flavor and customer enjoyment is how you guys process it, how long you hang it and stuff like What are your thoughts on that stuff? We believe in dry aging and we do. We hang anywhere, <clears throat> excuse me, from 14 to 40 days in our cooter. Our cattle are actually hung 21 to 30 days. And it's up to the customer how how long they want it to hang. But the hanging process does have a direct benefit to the texture and the taste of that meat. If I'm going to have a steak, I want it to be dry aged, not wet aged. 
and you want that hung as a whole carcass or half carcass or something like that for, half for the whole time. Yes. Half carcass, yeah, yeah. I've heard that makes a big difference on that. And I, I've tasted a difference. I know it does, and because a lot of the, like you said, some of these commodity beef giant processors, they can't hang for that long. They got to get them out, turn them in and out, right? They get them in there two, or three right. days and out the door to the grocery store, right? Yes. Yeah, so that's a big advantage. You know, like I said, I've never, I'd, I'd never heard of Akiyushi cattle before. I never tried it. So one of these days, the uh, have you know? I, I assume you eat your own stuff. I would assume, correct to some degree, right? Yes, <laughs> of course. How has been the? How do you describe it? You said it's got more of a buttery flavor. And what's your? Uh, obviously, you guys got to sell ground beef because that's half the cow. But <laughs> right. What's your favorite stuff to, to eat? Of course, the ribeye is my favorite, but I also love. The tri-tip, the Denver, the Colette, we do a flat iron steak. And, and these are not normal cuts. People don't know about these cuts. and But they're just wonderful. You just know what to cook with that cut and how to use it. Now, the, the ground beef has the most buttery taste there is. And it will be a unique taste. Once you eat Akaushi Burger... You won't want anything else. It is, it is a great tasting beef. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. The, the, the Denver, which some people call a Zabaton cut, it can be very, particularly as well, Marl, that can be delicious. I've had yes. one of those and I was really impressed with that. And uh, of course, I've eaten my share of ribeyes probably by the thousands at this point. Yeah. <laughs> you know? What is your, let me ask you a question. I'm a proponent of something called a carnivore diet where people just eat basically meat. Have you heard of that? Is that something you've messed with or what are your thoughts on that? <clears throat> yes. And I, I will phrase it this way to, to let you understand. We have been big beef eaters all of our life, all of our life. We, we eat quite a bit of beef. We have gone on the carnivore diet just recently by just taking vegetables and bread out of our diet because that's what our diet has been. Carnivore with vegetables and bread. Yes. And we're learning about it as we go. Uh, but it has already helped with weight loss. My wife had some fatty tumors around her elbow. Within two weeks, they're gone. Yeah, we are proponents of the carnivore diet. Yeah, it's interesting. These fatty tumors typical lipomas, this little growth of fat. And I have seen a number of people, like they go away. And... It's very interesting. So probably my, my, my guess is reducing the insulin level in your body because when you're consuming more of a carbohydrate-based diet, that tends to be higher in many cases. And so when that it's no longer giving this signal to grow, these things shrink back down. So it's pretty pretty interesting with that. And that's obviously carnivore. That I'm, I, this is the thing I'm trying to get the beef industry, the NCBA, to actually fund more research on this stuff. And I'm, I got a lot of pushback, but I think – I was on a podcast, the Joe Rogan podcast the other day and called it out. And that's, that's changed the narrative. I've gotten a lot of calls from people from NCBA saying, Hey, let's talk about how we can do some research here. So right. that's good news in my mind. But what is, as far as, was there ever a time when you thought, Hey, this ain't worth it anymore? Was there, what is your outlook for the future as far as ranching? Was it always something you love doing? And it's just, I'm doing it till I'm, till they, they bury me under the ground or what's been the, what's been your, has there been an that, evolution? That, that's our theory. We're going to, we're going to stay here till we're not here anymore. Yeah. But I think where the meat market and beef industry is going is to locally sourced animals. And I think it's going to be more and more, which we're finding at our meat market, that people are coming in requesting our meat only because they know we DNA test, they know where we're at, they know that we raise our cattle correctly, very humane. So <clears throat> that's where the market's going to be, knowing where you're getting your animal from. Yeah, it's. I'm going to go back because you mentioned something about if an animal got sick and you had to give them antibiotics, you pull them out of the program. Just in general, because most people, you hear all the, all the thing. I'm not going to eat that meat because it's pumped full of my antibiotics. But um, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is you can't go to slaughter with an animal's had antibiotics recently. It's got to be out of their system, flushed out for six yes. weeks. I don't know. It depend, probably depends on the antibiotics and, and, and that type of situation. But is that the truth that, I, that I've that is That is a fact, yes, sir. Yeah. But <clears throat> we go through history and say our cattle have zero antibiotics, zero, zero hormones. So we do not give them hormone injections to make them grow faster. 
uh, nor do we give them antibiotics, and they stay in our meat program. They can go. You can buy a calf of mine. If I've had to give him antibiotics, but he's not going to be considered antibiotic or hormone-free, and I'm not going to tell you he's Akaushi, even though he is. But, yeah, yeah. you can buy him. And, that, and interesting because if you're getting five pounds of growth out of them a day without hormones, that's that, that says a lot about the genetics, I assume, because this is the reason they do it for growth. And that's I think five is pretty close to anything anybody else is getting in a feedlot, if I'm not mistaken, correct? They can get a better press dollar-wise at a large feedlot and probably get pretty close to the same feed ratio that we feed. But we have our own feedlot on our ranch. We have bulk feeders, and we have a feed that is made strictly for our ranch. They, We had uh, Purina come out and do studies with us, and they developed a feed specifically for our calves. So we know what our cattle eat, and <clears throat> that's why I think we can get closer to that five pounds a day because of our feed that we're feeding. And do you guys participate in like seed stocks? Are you, if anybody wanted to get Lakeushi genetics, do you guys like sell some of your bulls and things like that? Or how does that work? We do not. There are groups out there, the American Akaushi Association, where you can find ranchers that sell 100% Akaushi cattle. And, <clears throat> but I actually buy from them. I don't raise registered stock other then I do have registered Angus cows, but you're not registering our calves as Angus. They are Akaushi, and they're done that through the DNA. You don't have a processing facility, which is obviously, I assume, very beneficial. Do you have any desire or capacity to expand your herd if, like you said, this sort of market takes off for you? Would you be able to buy or lease some more land and put more head of cattle on there? What's long-term thoughts on any of that stuff? Feasibly, no. Land, especially in Andrews County, isn't made anymore. And it is extremely hard to buy. Pasture land in Andrews County has a value, in my opinion only, of about $350 an acre. That's all that it can generate money coming back into your pocket through cattle. And yet people are selling it for thousands of dollars an acre right now. No, I could. There are two ranches, three ranches here in our county that they raise Akaushi also. They do not feed them internally. They send them to a feedlot. And as long as that feedlot can guarantee you that they're not giving antibiotics and they can control your death loss and sick loss, then that, that's fine. But it's hard for me to say, I'm sourcing out this animal to you. I know where it's been all of its life and send it somewhere else. But in the future, if the demand gets high enough, yes, I can buy cattle from other people in this area that are 50-50 Angus Akaushi. I can send them to a feedlot, have them fed out, bring them back in. What's the uh, thought on doing 100% Akaushi instead of a 50-50 Angus cross? Is there any advantage to that or disadvantage to that? I think the meat gets too rich. You are not going to enjoy 100% as you will a 50%. You're still getting that Akaushi intent into that meat, but it's not so rich you can't eat it. Even a 75% Akaushi gets a little too rich. So 50, 65% is where you want to be. So in Japan, they run 100%, I assume. And then it's just kind yes. of probably a small specialty. You have a few ounces of it type of thing. You're not putting down a 16. How big, are your rib- How big do you guys cut your ribeyes out of, out of curiosity? They're, they're usually an inch and a quarter to an inch and a half thick, and it depends on the weight of the animal of how big the ribeye actually is. You take a 1,500-pound animal, you're going to have a nice one-and-a-half-pound ribeye at an inch and a quarter. So that, that's where I like mine. Yeah, me too. I'd say, like I said, when I go to a restaurant, they got a, they got a eight ounce, ten ounce steak. I'm like, man, <laughs> yeah, they ain't gonna do it. <laughs> yeah, interesting. And as far as the, I, I imagine you don't have a lot of activist vegans out in West Texas protesting you guys or anything like that. Have you run into any of that stuff? 
You pretty much know everybody that's here, so now we don't have <laughs> Yeah, it's a different part of place. And how far are you guys? So you said you're in Andrews. How far away are you guys from, let's say, like Lubbock or something like that? We're 100 miles south of Lubbock, and we're 30 miles north of Midland, Odessa. Okay, okay. And I think I, I've seen Charlie's in here. Maybe Charlie buys your beef or something like that, one of our members or something. So yeah. that's how we got That's how we got hooked. It's making sense now. Yeah, Charlie is a good guy. So he has been carnivore, and his wife has been, and they've helped. They've tremendously improved their health. And What else is, uh, I think, to say? So what about, you said you got a well every, you got a watering station every half mile for your animals. How hard is it to water those animals out there in West Texas? We are at the very end of the Ogallaga aquifer and the Ogallaga is a very well documented stated aquifer has good water in it but we're at the very tail end so you have to be very determined to find water out here to find water we do drill some dry holes every now and then but fortunately we're where we find a well we're getting four or five gallons a minute out of that well with solar pumps and it works well now, I've heard some people say the Ogallala Aquifer is running down, like it's running out. Is that true? Or? I believe it is. I believe it is. And again, we're on the tail of it. I, I, in the past, have farmed just north of the branch, and <clears throat> we had center pivot irrigation. It would take three wells to run two pivots that needed 500 gallons a minute to run that pivot. In the last... 20 years that has grown to probably 12 wells excuse me 12 wells to run those two pivots so yeah it's extremely difficult so what happens when it runs out <laughs> we're in a bind yeah, I, I don't think we'll run out we just have to know what our water limits are yeah is there any way to i, I guess there's a there, there must be some things you've done over the years to become more efficient at it and at util, water utilization and I assume, is that correct? No, we, we, one of the things we do is we remove as much mesquite off of the property as we can so that what moisture we have gets to the plant, to the grass, and down to the aquifer, not going up in that mesquite tree. That is one of the ways we help remediate our country and save water is by the removal of mesquite bushes. And then, of course, you got to figure out the shade thing, so it's a balance. Yeah, yeah, you have things. to balance it. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think what, what else is uh, – do you – oh, you said you farm as well. Do you, do you grow some crops as well? Or we did. Crops we have there? since now sold the farms. We used to raise peanuts and cotton. Those were our two commodities with hay every couple of years, but not all the time. But now we it, – it become too difficult – to operate a farm and raise the amount of money you have to put a crop in every year. The last year I farmed, it, I had five pivots, quarter mile pivots. It cost me seven hundred and fifty something thousand dollars to farm those seven pivots, those five pivots. Pivots, I'm sorry. And <clears throat> I was betting everything on a crop that I didn't like doing. So we have since got out. Yeah, I can remember. I lived out in Lubbock, Texas for a while, and I remember the, the cotton was all, they had a ton of cotton. Yep. It would blow and get all over the place, and sometimes right. a year, depending on the time of the year and stuff. But yeah, it looks like it's snowing at certain times of the yeah, year. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's pretty, pretty impressive with that. So you said, because you, you have a, a particular ration you feed your animals, where does that come from? Where do you guys get it? Where do you get to, to, to finish out on? Actually, it comes out of Purina Mills. That's who produces our product for us. And they guarantee us that there's no hormones, antibiotics, anything in the feed. It's a corn with a mixture of meal and cottonseed and, and other products to make the meal that, that the cattle's appetite is. We also have limiters in that feed, which makes the cattle only want to eat so much at a certain time. They will eat it, they will go lay down, they will digest it, go back, eat some more, lay down, digest it. They don't eat to get full, poop it out, and start over. So prior to going to, to being finished when they're out, <clears throat> just grazing out in the land, what are they chewing on? Because there's not, like you said, there's not a bunch of lush grass, so they're just munching on the 
mesquite or what do they what do they eat? No, we we have good grass. It's it it's a good grass that they love to eat. But we also have a love grass that was introduced many years ago by the Highway Department of Texas to help build the bar ditches up. That is a fantastic grass, but they do not like to eat it. It's not palatable to them. So they will eat the good grass first because that's what's palatable. That's what they like. Once it gets short, then we have all this love grass that's big, tall, plush grass. They'll eat it. They don't like it, but they'll eat it and they do well on it. But we do supplement feed, especially in the winter out here. We have, we, we feed cake. If you understand what cake is, it's a small cube. We have a big feeder on the back of the truck, fill it up and just go out and you get three to five pounds per animal a day, three times a week. So we do supplement feed, but we do have good grass, but we also have sagebrush. We have weeds. And that's what gives the grass bed a unique flavor that you probably don't want. Yeah, in all honesty, I prefer I, I less prefer the taste of a grass fed animal. I had some last night. It, it tastes it's okay, but I prefer like I said, I've just got a different taste preference, and I think many people do. Speak of processing, one of the things that comes out of as I'm sure you're aware that it's more than meat that comes out of the animal. You got the bones, you got the hides, you got the off the off fall, the fat and the organs. What do you guys do with that stuff? Do you have a market for it? We do not have a market for the hide or the bones. We could have a market for the bones, but I don't know that we're big enough for someone to want to deal with us. The internal organs, other than the all fall, we have a company come and pick them up weekly, and that's usually turned into dog food or something else. So the hides, you know, Brazil, they can tan a hide for $50. There's not a market for hides anymore. The heads, yes, there's a market for We have enough Hispanic people out here that know how to use the head to to get the meat out that they want them. Yes, we have a market for this. We have the option, if you bring me an animal or you buy one of my animals, either way, we ask you, do you want the heart, liver, tongue? Uh, Do you want the kidney fat? Do you want the kidneys? Do you want the head and hide? You have the option of taking all that. If you don't, we will dispose of it by selling it to a customer or giving it away to a food bank. But you have the option to keep them. But that's a very good market out here is the all-fall market. Yeah. It's a shame about the highs because, and I don't know what the leather industry has done, but it's it's such a good product. And it seems a shame to waste that stuff because it's, it's it could be quite valuable. You sit down on a leather couch, a cowhide covered thing, it's quite a Nice piece exactly. Of material. Yeah. But to have um, one taxidermied right now, it's about $750. If you have a use for it or you like, that's a reasonable price. But to just go have a, tie, a high tent, that's not really feasible. Yeah. What about, uh, I saw Charlie come to tallow. I mean, because tallow is becoming, as you probably remember as a kid, they cooked everything in tallow. You go to like, right. Back in McDonald's in the 70s and 80s, it was tallow, and now it's all vegetable oil stuff. Any market for tallow? Is that yes, there is a big or? market for tallow. We render our tallow down, and we have it for sale. My wife actually makes lotion out of hers, out of part of it. She lotions her face, her body with it every day. We have seven dogs on the ranch, so she has to be careful and not fall or they'll lick her to death <laughs> because the tallow is so good. But, no, we have a market for tallow, and we do keep, if it's your animal and you request the tallow kept, we do keep it for you and give it to you. Yeah, I and I'm you. It's interesting because I've had tallow, and I remember one time I got some tallow from this place called it was Wagyu tallow from South Chicago Packing Place. Yeah, it was a different consistency because I guess it's such a high monounsaturated fat that it tends to be a little more liquidy. Is that the same thing you find with your tallow? Is it is it tend to be a different consistency? Yes, it'll actually if you put a piece of tallow or just the fat, not even tallow is rendered to be tallow. It's fat prior to that. Once it's rendered down, it's down. The fat, if you put it between your fingers, it takes less than three seconds to start melting that fat down. Yes, it it is a very good oil. And to go into your skin, it soaks in so quick and so easy. Yes. 
You, I've seen some people like cooking up briskets, and I'm sure you like brisket. I love brisket in Texas, yep. Texas. And, and some people will actually inject the brisket with tallow pre just to give it an additional flavor. Have you ever played with that? We we have. We also do a lot of the bone marrow. We will cut the bones into ringlets. Uh, scallops is what we call them. They're all different names. We put them on a pan above our brisket and let that tallow cook out of that, then that's what we add to the brisket is that bone marrow. Oh, it's just wonderful. Great, great. Yeah, I've had some like bone marrow butters and things like that were just amazing. That's it, it really gives it a nice flavor. Pete, we're running out of time. It was a pleasure chatting with you. And I just, just thank you for what you do, by the way. I, I always, you guys are people that feed us. And I don't, I always say we don't, we, there's everybody out there complaining about ranch. Well, the hell they're feeding you. I know it's a hard, I know it's a hard job and I know most ranchers don't get the thanks. And I like to personally just say that from myself. And I'm sure I speak for many of the people that enjoy what ranchers do. So keep up the good work. And I, it's crazy to think that we have to fight to, to there, there, there's going to be a fight to keep you guys in business and keep you guys in existence. And I'm 100% behind that, and hopefully uh, you guys will stay strong and, and realize what you're doing. Because when, when I go to – I presented to a number of cattlemen. I, I presented to the U.S. Cattlemen's Association a couple of times. I presented out to the California's Cattlemen's Association. And when I tell them that beef is an incredibly nutritious, wonderfully healthy food, a lot of them don't don't believe me or they don't – they didn't hear that. They've been told – they've been brainwashed by USDA. It's – bad for you type of stuff so it's just crazy so anyway just so you know it you're you guys are doing a wonderful job and well thank keep you. it up and thank you thank you thank you we that do this do it because we love the history and what we do to provide meat for the country we like doing it that's why we're here keep it up that's right <laughs> the west wasn't one on salads and we got to keep this stuff up hey that's um it. 